Uh, what I'm going to do is to, well, what I've done is to choose several works from the exhibit Higher Ground that I like especially well, uh, and I'm going to deal with them in some detail. So uh, I have actually a list of four works, and they are Belle Isle from Lion's View by Cameron, The Hauling of Marble by Branson, uh, C. Kermit Ewing's Landscape Redesign, and Joseph Delaney's Marble Collegiate Church. But since uh, my discussion of each of these works will take about 10 minutes, I'll probably leave off Delaney's Marble Collegiate Church and allow you to read about it in my book, which will be coming out in June of next year on Joseph Delaney, hopefully. Um, first painting, then, the first choice is Belle Isle from Lyons View of 1861. The artist signed and dated the work in neat red script, as you see at the lower right. At first glance, it resembles the painting entirely, uh, a classical composition like those painted hundreds of years ago by the French artist Nicolas Poussin while he toured Italy. But Belle Isle's title uh, confirms that the painting records a well-known Knoxville Vista uh, of the Smoky Mountains and, and the great bend of the Tennessee River, now Fort Loudoun Lake, as it appeared in midsummer in that year of 1861. It is a view that can easily be seen today from the grounds of the North Shore Mental Institute, formerly the Eastern State Mental Hospital of for the Insane, which opened in 1884. Uh, contemporary cartographers named the prominence in the river Lyons Island, but Bell Isle which might have been the backdrop to a Victorian novel, seems much more apt. The isle majestically floats on a glossy, reflective surface. The overlapping ridges of hills above the river in middle distance rise against the more distant and ever higher ranges. Thin gray washes of oil paint make the successive rises seem to recede further back in space. The highest and most distant peak, Mount Rocon, the motif to which all eyes are drawn, is positioned quite deliberately at the Candace's central point, except for one burnished specimen on the island itself. The trees are in full summer bloom, as did many Hudson River School painters of the 1850s and 60s. Cameron positions an American elm at the left border to serve as the observer's principal guidepost into the scene. The tree is at its peak of health each of its leaves drawn and painted one at a time <coughs> with the smallest of brushes, the lacy boughs point outward like fingers into the transparent sky. Two plump deer muse on the forward slope amid wildflowers. A log cabin with lean-to is sheltered in a hollow at the right. <coughs> Smoke uh, uh, drifts from the chimney, confirming human presence, and in the cabin, uh, a human presence in the cabin and a degree of domestic tranquility reigning therein as well. Wagon wheels weigh assembly, an ample haystack with a ladder tilted over it uh, has been ready for winter. A split rail fence bounds the tidy pasture. Nature and man live in peace and harmony. The cabin is not a rhetorical addition to the scene. In fact, it represents the storied manse of Captain William Lyon, who constructed it on Bowes Ferry Road, now Lakeshore Drive, in 1809, after purchasing 300 acres of wilderness that are bounded by the Tennessee River and Fort Creek. After enlargement, the cabin functioned more as an inn rather than a rude shelter, for it was here that the robust and gregarious Scottish host lavishly entertained, among other worldlies, General Andrew Jackson and Isaac Anderson the Presbyterian preacher and educator who founded the forerunner of Maribel College in 1819. Here was also born Lyons' eight children, eight surviving children, including Mary, who in 1847 uh, became the wife of John J. Craig, Sr., the first in a line of prominent East Tennessee marble producers. A skillful businessman and speculator, Lyon and his wife, the former Mary Clark, would have, uh, could have afforded a grand Italianate mansion closer to Knoxville's bustling center, but like Thoreau, preferred to live modestly amid beautiful and secluded surroundings. The geographic locus of Lyons' view is a physically existing master work, 
a real landscape that changes its moods by the minute, hour, climb, and the seasons. To this day, the geograph geographic locus continues to bear the name of the man who, through a contract, through signing a contract and paying, paying money, claimed discovery and ownership over it. It is first Lyons' view that we encounter in Cameron's painting before it is an our view of his view. What circumstances brought Cameron to Knoxville in the auspicious year of 1861 are not known, but much can be said about Cameron himself. He was born a Scottish Highlander in Greenwich in 1817, immigrated with his family to Philadelphia in 1833, uh, there received some art training, and in hopes of becoming a frontier corporatist, moved to Indiana Indianapolis in 1839. Uh, by 1847, when he married the artist Emma Alcock, he had returned to Philadelphia. But between 1847 and 1851, the couple lived and worked in Italy. Cameron's Italian subjects were shipped back to exhibitions held by the Pennsylvania Academy of Fine Arts. Repatriating again in 1851, Cameron worked in Chattanooga for the businessman politician Colonel James A. Whiteside. Among the white side commissions are several oils that portray the towns, that town's dramatic overlooks with the same clear crispness and atmospheric translucency that are to be found in Belt Isle from Lyons View. The most striking of these is Cameron's Colonel and Mrs. James A. Whiteside, son Charles and Servants, painted in 1858 in the Hunt, it's now in the Hunter Museum of Art. Prospering as a portraitist and landscapist, and supported by his wife's inheritance, Cameron built a mansion on Cameron Hill, which was named in his honor. He took refuge in Philadelphia for the duration of the Civil War, but uh, was too disheartened by the war's destruction to resettle in Chattanooga. He ceased painting altogether, and with wife moved to Oakland and San Francisco, California, traveling back and forth, uh, where he, Cameron, transformed himself into a Presbyterian minister. He died in Oakland in 1882. This biography suggests that our painting, Belle Isle, was made during the interim between the artist's departure from Chattanooga and before his return to Philadelphia. It is reasonable to assume, to assume at least reasonable to me, that Cameron and Lyon met during this interim and that they found much common ground given their Scotch ancestry and their interest in the Presbyterian ministry. One, scene, one sense that Lyon, like Whiteside, gave Cameron specific instructions as, what, as to what to paint in his painting, since it was his view, Lyon's, before it became Cameron's. In the late 1860s, the Craigs themselves resided in the Lyon cabin for a brief time, and it is not surprising that Belle Isle, from Lyon's view, eventually became a Craig family heirloom before it was uh, um, purchased by the Tennessee Museum. My second choice is Lloyd Branson's The Hauling of Marble, Oil on Canvas, 1910. It returns us obliquely to the Craig family, no pun intended. Uh, by 1910, when Knoxville and East Tennessee had become, after Vermont and Georgia, America's chief internal source for quality building and sculpting material, locally known as Holston Marble, Knoxville's John J. Craig Company, managed by John J. Craig III, uh, stood at the top of the trade. Craig would not found the well-known Pandora Marble Company until 1914, but his in enterprise already encompassed uh, a number of quarries, some with marble processing capabilities. Always anxious to draw a complementary light on Tennessee, East Tennessee's historical, social, and economic achievements. Branson, in this instance, uh, wanted to make sure the marble industry was not left out. Normally, dry numerical indexes were all the public had to gauge uh, by the strength and influence of the local marble, marble industry. How many tons of marble were produced, how many dollars were earned per year, uh, how many men were employed in its production. But in the hauling of marble, Branson focuses on the often overlooked human element that was an integral aspect of the business, just as did Winslow Homer in his classic depictions of anonymous but heroic fishermen who risked their lives daily uh, to, for the benefit of the Grand Banks fishing industry of Gloucester, Massachusetts. Although his painting style differs a lot from Homer's, Branson's 
Branson deals with the same uh, man against nature predicament that the older painter, Winston Homer, made his thematic stock and trade. A horse cart carrying a 10 ton block of marble that bears the impress of parallel stall marks is being driven on its way from a quarry to a delivery station on an unpaved road. It arouses the extreme excitement of a boy and a mongrel dog as it passes a farmhouse. Four frenzied outriders lash the hides of the horses that pull the badly listing wagon and its freight. The reason for their urgency is made apparent in the rapidly approaching storm cloud, the steep incline they have just encountered, as well as in the way that the real wheel of the wagon sinks into the muddy shoulder at the right. The sharp leftward, leftward swing of the lantern on the back of the wagon um, underscores its precarious position. Although chains and a wooden wedge continue to secure the block, we can easily anticipate that terrifying moment when the wagon, riders, horses, and their cargo will begin their fatal tumble. While Cameron's landscape achieves dramatic effect through stillness and silence, and through a breathtakingly patient and steady workmanship, Branson complements the dramatic storyline of his painting with a hurried and impetuous technique. We can imagine his painting hand and arm vigorously gesturing back and forth uh, with brush and palette knife as he painted uh, as if at the same time as uh, whipping the horses that the riders must urge forward. The heavy strokes of wet oil on the canvas have been scraped over crusty dry layers beneath them and obscure much of the detail that Cameron would have felt obliged to bring to perfection. Cameron withholds energy. Branson, through a cultivated carelessness, glorifies in it. Branson's uh, bold signature, his moniker, defiantly declares his authorship of the Hollywood Marble. Lloyd Branson, 1854-1926, uh, considerably broadened the, and here we, we parallel a bit with Jack that has just told us about, the uh, definition of art for a fledgling group of local artists. The collectors, Mrs. Louis P. Audichet, Lou Tyler, Thomas Campbell, James Wallace, Adelia Armstrong Brooks, Catherine and Eleanor Wiley, and Charles, Charles Crouch, among about 30 other members. He was born of English parents in Union County, which is now part of Knox County, and was schooled in Knoxville at the uh, East Tennessee University. In 1873, he began touring, uh, uh, he began several years of study at the uh, New York's National <coughs> Academy of Design, and then went on a tour of French art studios, which enabled him to acquire an acceptably French technique and outlook. He even began sporting, as his, his obituary picture shows in the newspaper, a French beret. Between 1880 and 1903, in company with the photographer Frank B. McCrary, Branson established Knoxville's own version of an art academy in South K Street. Well connected with local conservative elite and a driving force behind the Nicholson Art League, 1899 to 1923, which was financed by former Confederate Major Calvin Hunter Nicholson, and much exhibited Branson became the official artificer of East Tennessee's leading citizens and of the events that counted uh, as its crucial military milestones. Visual documentation was his first goal in creating these official works, thus he had no authorial scruple uh, against reproducing earlier paintings or photographs. He forthrightly declares at the base of the painting of the likeness of the academic administrator Horace Maynard in 1903 that it was made from a photograph and Branson's painting entitled U.S. Barracks, Knoxville, 1793, uh, painted in 1907, illustrates as closely as possible, he says again, an old-timer's verbal recollection, recollection of that old fort. In 1892, for the Ladies Memorial Society of Knoxville, Branson designed a Confederate mm -hmm. memorial for Bethel Cemetery on Nelson Street. In his studio, he carved a colossal statue about eight feet high um, of a Confederate sentry that surmounts a 50-foot shaft. The soldier faces in a northerly direction. The third choice is C. Kermit Ewing's Landscape Redesign, Oil on Canvas, 1943. And with this painting, we descend to lower ground. In this work, we confront a trashy commercial block, apparently at night. The building is symmetrically arranged and placed parallel to the painting's surface, somewhat like an internal frame. 
Edward Hopper's Lonely City Views, particularly his Sunday morning of 1930, immediately come to mind. Only that artist, Hopper's uh, musical palette, sonorous palette, uh, avoids black lines, even, night, even in his night scenes. And Hopper's soft brushings elevate the drab uh, structures in his paintings to a poetic and mysterious realm. None of that poetry is to be found in Ewing's example, and purposely so. Thinly painted surfaces of black, lusterless dark greens, dark blues, tops, browns, and sandy grays define the building fronts. These architectural ghosts bear the tenuous proportions, uh, tenuous proportions and pretentious classical details of the cast iron bow mania that gripped America in, in American cities in the 1870s. There are three sets of tall double doors, those inside the outer bays being inset from, from the sidewalk. Three tenement window, windows above that broken glass. The storefronts are littered with graffiti, the scribbled insults of fugitive children, and several rudimentary figure drawings. One defunct, uh, defunct commercial space is apparently a night spot named the Blue Door. While in our other selections, I have a few paintings, nature dominates, this image of decaying city uh, closes out all chances of nature showing itself. No trees, flowers, sky, insects, not even a solitary bird is here. No human beings, human beings are to be seen either, only their cerebrates, the strutting city bred dog full of bravado, the downtrodden cat who prepares for its, its, its escape. Ewing, the professional artist, must have enjoyed scripting this graffiti. For as he did, he could vicariously immerse himself in the lives and experiences of his fugitive artists. Ewing coyly signs his own name on a window molding and prints the date on a column post. It is no accident that the notice attached to the blue door's window, quote, tables for ladies, unquote, is posted close by the artist's signature. <laughs> In some of the other notations, Ewing humorously uh, understates the expected severity of the kind of language we would expect to find even during the World War II era in abandoned public places. Uh, one example, go to hell. Right. Billy is a fatty, hello skinny. Uh, the Joe loves Annie notation seems almost too obvious. But then there's another one that says, quote, Peggy is a who, W-H-O, and then a black post is suddenly intervenes <laughs> to, to make us wonder what that word is. Uh, it's an indictment which helps to neutralize any hint of sentimentality. But what most highlights Ewing's playful search for artistic identity in a derelict urban environment is the entry that reads, quote, this property is for sale. See your dealer. Indeed, Ewing, 1910 to 1976, was a peripheral player in the academic art world in 1943. He was born into an impoverished Pennsylvania family. His first oil, Fair, Fairview Avenue, 1938, which he produced while attending Carnegie Tech, was of a shabby Pittsburgh neighborhood, not unlike the surroundings of landscape design. Having won a football scholarship at Carnegie, Ewing pursued a BA degree in studio art, then an MA, awarded 1938, with the intention of teaching art at the high school level, which he proceeded to do so in, in, in towns in Pennsylvania and New York State for six years. He returned to Carnegie, uh, uh, the Carnegie Art Department, as a member of its studio faculty during the 1945 and 46 season, and to assist as a uh, Carnegie Tech football coach, while also moonlighting <coughs> in a shipyard. Andy Warhol, who was a student, who as a student, gamely stuck it out with Carnegie Institute Art Department until 1948, his graduation, uh, quite possibly attended one of uh, Buck's uh, classes. With his own background in mind, Buck doubted whether sissies and complainers could be true artists. Mm -hmm. Said he, you have to make life for yourself. Don't count on external help. He came to the University of Tennessee's Knoxville campus in 1947 for the express purpose of developing a studio art program 
Like other land-grant universities in the, in the immediate post-war period, the university realized that an expanding art program was sure to attract returning veterans who were eligible for free tuition on the GI Bill. As he had on earlier occasions, Ewing set about forming an art group that gathered its members from diverse walks of life, commercial, lower, uh, commercial firms, local ones, uh, the Oak Ridge Institute of Nuclear Studies, the Tennessee Valley Authority, while he also added to the University of Tennessee's art department's new faculty studio in art history from leading universities and institutes uh, throughout the country. Banding together as prize-winning professionals, the core of Ewing's acolytes were in every sense participants in a movement. Ewing's prognosis in 1960 that the mid-20th century may well evolve the style which will be equally identified with the times as Impressionism was uh, with the last half of the 19th century, was generally confirmed by his closest colleagues, Carl Sublett, Walter Stevens, Joanna Higgs, Robert Birdwell, Richard Clark, and Philip Nichols. Uh, by identifying their work with international currents, they felt legitimately expressed conditions of contemporary life, including psychological truths as well as social truths, uh, the Knoxville Seven, as they called themselves in the early 1960s, formulated a position not unlike that of the Nicholas and Arkley painters, Catherine Wiley, uh, Branson, and Tyler. The first difference, however, was that the Seven, as their anti-sentimental numerical appellation suggested, had no illusions about random, had no illusions about the randomness and cruelty of modern urban life. Their group was comprised of social activists and aesthetic radicals who came to Knoxville from northern and eastern mostly cities. While the Nicholson Art League was made up of individuals who had money, property, and position, mostly, and were aesthetically conservative. Another difference was that the opinion of, that it was the opinion of the seven that the artist should avoid the temptation to confront nature as a highly appreciative but essentially alien agent. Rather, as Clark Stevens and Sublet suggested, the artist should seek a mystical identification and, and sympathetic integration into the forces that govern nature. Sounding like a Taoist poet, Richard Clark said, quote, the supreme gift of life consists in its revelation of that secret private world wherein the fortunate initiate becomes inseparably bound to the world of creation, where boundaries of space-time no longer separate and divide man against man, against nature, against one. Not, uh, that's it. I'm done. <laughs> <laughs>